In the 1860s, U.S. Army soldiers under the command of General Patrick O'Connor began prospecting in a narrow canyon 20 miles south of Tooele, Utah. The soldiers had become aware that the local Native American tribe, the Goshutes, were using bullets, partially made of silver, as well as making silver jewelry. They traced the Goshutes and their silver to some rudimentary diggings in Ophir Canyon. The soldiers seized control of the diggings, staked out new claims, and began a few basic mines. Serious mining operations did not begin until about 1870, when a formal town was founded. The town itself was little more than a narrow strip of building stretched along a steep, narrow canyon. Throughout the decade, Ophir's population quickly swelled into the thousands, as the mines yielded large amounts of lead, silver, and zinc, as well as some small amounts of copper and gold. The town boasted hotels, drugstores, mercantiles, two schools, a fortified post office, multiple saloons, a couple of dance halls, as well as a red light district. Large mines such as the Pocatello, the Ophir, Shamrock, Silveropolis produced tens of millions of dollars worth of ore throughout the 1870s. By the early 1880s, the easy ore in the canyon was mined out. Mining activity slowed as the mine shifted from horizontal shafts to vertical shafts, and the minor shanties were slowly replaced with orchards and small farming plots. Throughout the 20th century, fewer and fewer people called over home. Maggie Tolman Porter, who grew up on a ranch in nearby Rush Valley, remembered visiting Ofer during the early part of the 20th century. Quote, Ofer was a beautiful little mining town. I can still see in my mind's eye the beautiful autumn colors as we drove up the canyon to do our marketing. I can remember the purple elderberries along the creek and the flashing maples and wildflowers. I can still remember the ruins of a house by the roadside, a mile or two from the town. Mother showed me the blackened ruins and told me how the mother and father had locked their two little children in the home and then both went into town and got drunk. Their home caught fire and the children were burned to death. I was always saddened by the sight of those ruins. Mining activity in Ophir finally ceased in 1971 and the town was all but a ghost town. Today, the town has experienced a revival with the town population booming in the summer months. Many of the old buildings and homes have been restored, with the addition of new homes in town. A visitor to Ofer can still see the tailing piles and the old minecart rails that once meant a busy and profitable life in Ofer. Mercure is the town that refused to die. Over the last 150 years, Mercure has been mined heavily and is also the birthplace of one of the most important gold extraction processes ever devised. As a town, Mercure began life known as Lewiston when prospectors found enough gold to justify building a town in 1870. Gold mining was the business driving the town between 1870 to 1873 when the town reached a population of 2,000. Between 1874 and 1878, the gold veins were mined out and the town became a ghost town for the first time. The town's first resurrection began in April 1879 when a German prospector, Ari Pinedo, discovered cinnabar, a natural form of mercury. Believing he had discovered a huge amount of mercury, he named his claimed Mercur, which, as one might guess, is German for mercury. The mercury that Ari Pinedo found also contained a fair amount of gold but the gold was unable to be extracted with the known ore processing practices of the time. Still, mining activity continued to grow in the area. In about 1890, Pinedo sold his mercury claim for $10,000 to a group of men from Nebraska who formed a mining company and a new mill was erected near the claim. The mill, however, was a total failure and the mining company was set to fold. One of the men who purchased the claim sent an ore sample to Colorado to undergo a new ore treatment process using cyanide. The sample proved promising, and a new cyanide mill was built at Mercure. With the new mill came new money and a new town. The town could no longer be called Lewiston because another town in the Utah Territory had taken the name. The residents decided to adopt the name of Pinedo's claim, and Mercure was born again. The 1890s were good to Mercure, a new cyanide mill, the Golden Gate, was built in 1898, and it was the first of its kind. The mill required an enormous amount of electrical power, 
and a hydroelectric dam was built 32 miles away to feed its electrical need. June 26, 1902. A grease fire broke out in a Chinese restaurant about 9 in the morning. The fire spread quickly throughout the business district. By noon, every building in the business district was in ashes. The residential district as well as the mill survived the fire and the town was quickly rebuilt. And by 1913, mining and milling were no longer profitable and the town withered until 1917 when, for the second time, it became a ghost town. Mining operations in Mercury began again in the 1930s and lasted until the United States entered World War II and then began again in the 1980s. Today, Mercury's quiet. No mills, no town, and few ruins. Just the tailings and scars around a very small valley where once over 10,000 people lived and worked. In 1870, several prospectors found a rich outcropping in a canyon in Jube County. Believing they had found a mammoth load of pay dirt, they called their claim Mammoth. They opened a mine, and a small camp sprung up at the head of the canyon right below the mine. By 1873, the original owners were not as enthusiastic about their Mammoth mine, and traded their control of the mine to the McIntyre brothers, in exchange for their herd of Texas Longhorns that were on their way to market in Salt Lake City. The McIntyre brothers invested heavily in the mine, and it paid off. Soon, tons of ore containing gold, silver, and copper, as well as lead, were hauled out of the mine each month. Other mines in the area were dug with mills and smelters to process the wealth-laden ore. Mammoth grew along with the mines. Mammoth faced one serious problem, however, water. The valley had very little water, and what water there was, was guzzled by the mining process. Drinking water had to be shipped in. A town resident had to pay 10 cents a gallon, or a dollar a barrel. In 2020, that's $2.14 a gallon, or $21 a barrel. By 1890, two new mills were built in the Lower Canyon, the Sioux and the Mammoth. One man, George H. Robinson, determined to leave his mark on the canyon, as he worked as an engineer for the McIntyres at the Sioux Mill. He plotted a town around the mill and named it after himself. Robinson, it is said, was an egocentric man, and he wore on the patience of the McIntyres. Robinson was eventually sacked, but his town lived on. The town of Robinson was so close to Mammoth that it became known as Lower Town, and Mammoth became known as Upper Town. A railroad was built in the Robinson and served both communities. Eventually, enough people crowded into the canyon that the two towns grew together. At its height, Mammoth boasted many large hotels, saloons, churches, a baseball diamond, as well as hospitals and restaurants. Mines continued to yield rich ores, and some miners began to high-grade chunks of valuable ore out with them at the end of their shift. They smuggled ore out any way they could, in bandages and hats, lunch pails, etc. The McIntyres became wise to the smuggling and constructed what were called dry rooms, where miners changed their clothes before and after the shifts to reduce the chance of smuggling. One local saloon owner made his fortune by trading drinks for the smuggled ore. He stashed the ore until one day he sold the saloon and disappeared into the west, not to be heard from again. Once a thriving town of nearly 3,000 people, by 1930, the population of Mammoth was fewer than 750 souls. Rising costs of production and lower grade ore had given people little reason to stay. Over the course of the next few decades, many of the buildings were robbed away to be used in other construction or simply rotted away in the sun. Few people call Mammoth home today, and some minor digging still happens in the valley. 